All right, well, good morning again. It's great to see you guys this morning. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and then we're going to flip over to Matthew chapter 1 here in a moment. We are, we are in week two of our Christmas celebration here in our church, and we're thankful uh, that uh, as we continue our study looking at the, the, the characters of Christmas, that we come across two young lovers in Mary and Joseph so in Luke chapter 1. Now, how many of us have, how many of you have met someone you did not expect to meet? Unexpected. Maybe you, maybe you have met a future spouse in an unplanned way, uh, like I did. Uh, maybe uh, you have met a celebrity, an actor, an athlete, so, or a, a musician, somebody that you weren't expecting to meet. For example, uh, there's a lot of talk about Harrison Ford being in Morristown a lot because his wife or girlfriend or whoever she is has family in Talbot, and so people run into Harrison Ford unexpectedly. And I'm sure that, a lot, that all of us in this room have received unexpected news. Sometimes that news can be uh, a bad thing. You, go to, you show up to work one day, and, and, and you're told by your boss that you're, that you're no longer employed uh, there at your job. Uh, this past week, we, we remembered the 81st anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Unexpected, unexpected turn of events there uh, in, 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 at Pearl Harbor. It, that it was the event that ushered the United States of America into World War II. Other times, unex, unexpected news can be good. It can be a positive thing. It can be something that, that, that uh, turns out to be a blessing to us that we didn't anticipate, a surprise engagement, a surprise pregnancy after dealing with so much infertility, that, that unexpected news and meeting unexpected people in unexpected places, those things are often shocking to us. You know, there's a phrase that people say, expect the unexpected, but how can you really expect the unexpected? It, it, it's quite Im, Im, implausible for you to try to, to prepare yourself and plan for every situation and possibility of a circumstance. It's impossible to do that. That new that that advice, expect the unexpected, was would not have been advice that Mary and Joseph would, would have been able to follow in their lives. Mary and Joseph are a young couple, legally bound to be betrothed and to be married. And, they, and yet they find out that Mary is with child. That was not the news they were expecting, especially since that they had not consummated their marriage. It's shocking to them. And yet Mary and Joseph, at the birth of Jesus, helped tune us into the hope of Christmas. And we're going to start looking at that in Luke chapter 1. So if you'll stand with me, we'll begin to read Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. And here is what Luke says. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying. And tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give, him, give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son in the sixth month uh, with, with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible 
with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray together. Father, God, again, we're thankful for uh, this Christmas season. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to remind ourselves who is at the center of the universe, and it's Jesus. God, we're thankful for the truth of your word, and we pray this morning that it would inform us, and Lord, it would transform us. Lord, that we would find it to be insightful and helpful, and Lord, we, we would find our hearts being strangely warmed and drawn to Jesus in deeper and more meaningful ways. God, I pray that you would speak to us now, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph. Mary is a key figure in the life of Jesus. As we're looking at the cast of Christmas, the characters of Christmas, there may be no more important person other than Jesus himself than Mary. Mary, of course, being uh, the mother of Jesus, her name is a common name. Mary is a very common name. Uh, and Mary is from a common place. Nazareth is the kind of town that, uh, that, that didn't have any glitz or glamour. Nazareth is not, is not a town that famous people live in. It's not a town for wealthy people. The cultural elites do not live in Nazareth. Nazareth is a backwater town outside of Jerusalem. Nazareth is not known for anything. It, it, it's a nowhere town. It seems insignificant on the map. It, has, it doesn't have a great reputation. People are not flocking to live in Nazareth. It's, that's one reason why the future disciple Nathaniel said, hey, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's got a pretty poor reputation. It's not the, it's, it's, it's not the happening place where you would expect God to break into the world the way that he does. It's not a prominent place. And yet, this is where God begins the Christmas story. The Lord does not choose to work through prominent people or prominent places. He could, he could have chosen to use Herod's daughter, the governor's daughter, uh, a, 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 to carry the baby Jesus, but he doesn't do that. He's not interested in, in, in calling only the elite or the noble. He could have chosen to work in Jerusalem or some other uh, glitzy town, but instead he chooses a young teenage girl in a podunk town called Nazareth. And this is the place that God starts this amazing story, that he picks Mary in Nazareth. Mar to put this in context, Mary is only about 14 to 16 years old. Sometimes we think about Mary and we think that she's a mature woman, that she kind of has her life together, that she's still young, but she's not quite this young. Mary is a teenager, 14 to 16. Typically, you would get married that young. And so here she is, 14 to 16 years old. Mary is poor. How do we know that? Because uh, after Jesus is born, they go to the temple to make an offering for their, uh, to make a sacrificial offering for their sins, and they can't afford to even buy a sacrificial lamb, so they have to, they have to go with plan B and choose another offering. They don't have any money. Again, Mary is not well off. She's a young, poor, teenage girl here. So why does God choose to use Mary? Why does God choose to use her? First, I don't know if you're aware, but Mary is a descendant of the king of King David, the greatest king in the, in the history of Israel. That David has several sons. Nathan and Solomon are, are two of the most notable sons. And Mary is related to David through Nathan. Joseph is related to David through Solomon. So she's got an important family history. That's key because God made a promise. I'm going to bless this family from Abraham to David that, that this family tree will produce the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And so she has an important family that God made a promise to. Second reason that God chose her is because she was a virgin. Now, she's legally married uh, to Joseph. Now, marriage back in this day wasn't you show up at the courthouse, 
You say your I do's, you show up at the church house, say your I do's, and it's over. That marriage had, that being married was a process of several steps, and they had already completed the first process. Their relationship was public. They had already committed themselves to each other, but, but they had not consummated their marriage, okay? They had, not, they had not slept together, and so she was still a virgin, Okay, now that matters because as we read a moment ago, Isaiah 7, 14 says that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. So God's going to keep his promise. And so he chooses a young virgin girl here named Mary. Now, there are, if you're reading throughout the Bible, there are many miraculous pregnancies. Sarah was, was 75 years old giving birth to her first son. Okay, Hannah was barren, and, and, and she prayed that God would open her womb, and God answered that prayer. There are many miraculous pregnancies in Scripture, but there is only one virgin birth. Now, we'll talk about why being a virgin is so important here in a moment, but, but her being a virgin is extremely significant. And so the angel shows up here, and he tells Mary that she's pregnant, and he opens up by saying, Mary, you are highly favored by God. In other words, Mary, you've been chosen by God for a great purpose. A king is coming. He's bringing a kingdom. He's bringing peace. He's bringing a kingdom that will never end, that, that, that the Messiah is coming. And Mary's initial response to the angel is not great. Jesus is coming. But instead, it says in verse 29 that she was greatly troubled. In verse 34, how is this possible? I'm a virgin. How is it possible that I'm with child when I haven't known a man, when I haven't slept with a man? It really is the most unexpected news in the history of the world. That, that the angel Gabriel says the Holy Spirit is at work within you. God's giving you this child. Verse 37, he is the Holy Son of God. And, be, and that's, it, it, it's possible because nothing is impossible with God. And so Mary moves from a, from a response of fear to a response of faith. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. You know, Mary in the, in the Bible is the ultimate woman of faith. Here she is, a young, really a young girl, and she says yes to God, it, it, that this, this plan of God is one of the most significant, outrageously out-of-the-box plans that you could ever possibly conceive. In fact, you've pro it's so out of the box, you wouldn't conceive of it. I mean, she took, she took God at his word. God, you're saying you're giving me this child. I've not slept with a man. You're saying he's the savior of the world. I'm going to trust you. Can you imagine how that conversation would go with her mom and dad? She's 14 or 16 years old, walks in the living room of the house. Mom, dad, good afternoon. It's great to see you guys. I hope, I, I've got something I need to share with you. I hope you, you can find a seat. I'd love for you to sit down. You're going to want to be seated for this. Hey, mom, dad, I'm pregnant. And then, and then Mary's mom says, Mary, but how could you? you we're not in the, we're, you're not at the place where you could consummate your marriage with Joseph. I mean, did you cheat? Did you, did you have an affair? I mean, what, Mary, what's going on? I mean, how could you be pregnant? I mean, I mean you have your whole life in front of you, and, and now you, 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 you've gone outside of, of, of our standards and our norms. I can't believe you disgrace our family. How could you be pregnant, Mary? And Mary goes, no, 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 Mom, it's okay, Mom. Mom, it's okay because the baby's been given to me by God. I'm not slipping with a man that, that the Holy Spirit has, has spoken to me and that, that God has put this child in my womb. Imagine how hard of, of, of news that would be to receive if you were Mary's parents. Let's go a step further. Imagine how unexpected and shocking that would be to Joseph, her legally betrothed husband. Hey, um, Joseph, I've got some news. Um, I need you to know that I know we're starting our life together, and, and, and you're young, and I'm young, and, and you've got a good job, and our families are here, and, and there's a lot of risks associated with this, Joseph, but, but you need to know that I'm pregnant. 
And in Joseph's heart, you have to imagine that Joseph is probably outraged. Where is the man you slept with? Where is this guy? Well, I need to talk to him. I, I, I got some things I want to say to him. How could you do this to me, Mary? I mean, I've committed, I've pledged my love to you. How could you betray me like this? No, 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 Joseph, none of you don't understand. This child's from God. I haven't slept with another man. I've been faithful to you, Joseph. It, the Lord's put a baby in my womb. How unexpected, how shocking is the news of Christmas? How, how bewildering and crazy is this news? So how does Joseph respond? I mean, how would you feel in this moment? You know, Joseph is a fascinating person in the Bible because we don't know a whole lot about him. Joseph is the strong, silent type. Not one word that Joseph ever spoke is recorded in Scripture. Joseph, none of his words are recorded here. Joseph is a young man between the age of 18 and 21 years old. Mary's 14 to 16. Uh, Joseph would, would have been between 18 to 21. And something interesting about Joseph is, is that Joseph is also called a son of David. He's from the line of Solomon, another king of Israel. So David was a king, then Solomon was a king. Joseph came from that line of kings in Israel. Now, here's what that means. You're going, what's the big deal? Joseph had a rightful claim to be the king of Israel at, in this time. He's got all the right credentials. He comes from the, right, the, the, the exact kingly line of Israel. If the kings of Israel had not fallen into sin and idolatry and led people away from God, uh, if that had, had not happened, Joseph would be king right here. Joseph has all the pedigree. Joseph has everything, there, everything that, that would qualify him to be the leader of the nation of Israel. And yet, and yet they go under occupation uh, by other nations because of their sin and their idolatry. God judges them. And so what, what happens to Joseph? He should have been king. Joseph's a carpenter. He's a, he's a bricklayer. Your translation says carpenter. Sometimes your translation, if you uh, will we'll say mason, that Joseph worked with his hands. Instead of being a king, he, 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 he is a tradesman. Now, I want you to think about that how, and how significant this is. Again, God does nothing by accident in your life. God does nothing by accident in my life. And God does nothing by accident in human history. Think about this. So Joseph would have been king and is not king. Instead, Joseph is a carpenter who builds things. He's a mason who builds things. Think about this. God the Father creates with his word, and Joseph recreates things with his hands. Jesus is the son of the father who creates universes, and now he will become the adoptive son of his father, Joseph, who recreates things. Joseph, ta Joseph takes old things and makes them into new things. Jesus will follow in, under, in his footsteps and take us, uh, the, our sin, our weakness, our failures, our shortcomings, and he makes us into new creations. So when God was planning the birth of, his, uh, 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 of our Savior, his son, Jesus Christ, he specifically had, had, brought, had brought together Mary and Joseph. It, this was, their relationship is no accident. There are no, God is not overlooking the details of our lives, that God has brought this together in a significant way. And so the would-be king of Israel is now going to raise the king of Israel, the king of heaven, Jesus. And one thing we know about Joseph is that Joseph must have really loved Mary. I mean, when Joseph hears the news that she's pregnant, here's the truth. Joseph has several responses he could have chosen. Now, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Check this out. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, before they slept together, before they consummated their marriage, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, 
resolve to divorce her quietly. Again, you imagine his response here and how upset Joseph would be. Joseph's got options. Option number one, and this was the traditional way this situation was dealt with. Adultery or uh, unfaithfulness was dealt with in a very public manner. Option number one is, is that Joseph could have brought her out in the middle of town and he could have divorced her and publicly humiliated her. He could, that, that the custom of the day would have been is to bring the unfaithful partner out and to publicly shame them. In fact, that it was not uncommon that the, uh, the, um, the legal ramifications for adultery is that you'd be stoned to death. He could have, he could have had her killed for her unfaithfulness or it looked like her to be on her, on her, her unfa- unfaithfulness on face value. He could, have had, he could have had her publicly shamed in such a way that no man, no self-respecting man would ever want to go near her again. If he, if he, was, if he was full of vengeance and hate and wanting to get back at her, he could have done that. That, that was an option. Of, that was actually the most common option available to him. But instead, he has a second option. And He's, it says that he's unwilling to shame her, so he will leave. So, in other words, he will leave her quietly. There's a clean exit. Hey, Mary, I, I care for you. I, I'm having a hard time believing that God has put a baby in your womb and you've not slept with somebody. I'm having a hard time believing that. I want the best for you. I, 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 I committed myself to you. I'm not sure how I can get past this in my heart and my mind. So. How about you just go your way and I'll go my way and we'll never talk about it again? That's Joseph's train of thought here. And then an angel shows up. Look at verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph is going through all of his options as to how to deal with Mary, and an angel shows up, and an angel says, Joseph, don't run away from her. Don't leave her. This is part of God's plan for you both, that this child is a miracle child. This child is not just an ordinary baby. It's the Son of God who, will, who, who is given to us to save us from our sins. Call him Jesus. Look at how he responds in verse 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, he took his wife, and, but he knew her not until, he get, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Ma- Joseph doesn't run from Mary. He runs to Mary. He, uh, he makes the marriage. He signs all of the paperwork. He, he, he crosses all the T's and dots, all the I's. The, the wedding license is signed. Everything looks good in public, but he doesn't sleep with her in order to keep her a virgin to fulfill this prophecy. And so you're saying, okay, so here we have, we have the story of Mary and Joseph, but what, what, what do we see here? Here's what we see. We see that what they have in common is they have a great big faith in God. That, and, and, oftentimes, and oftentimes having big faith means taking big risks. What they are going to embark upon with the, with the unborn Jesus in her womb, what, the, what is happening here is going to cost them everything in their life. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's going to cost them everything. But what's amazing about their story is, they, is that they believed God, which is why I want you to see this. Faith is rewarded with heartfelt hope. Faith and hope are tied together. That, 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 that Mary and Joseph are the ultimate pictures of faith in the Lord. This news is so unexpected, so inconceivable, that, that today nobody would believe this. You know what I think? 
one of the hardest things in terms of the Christian faith for a lot of people to wrap their mind around. It's the virgin birth of Jesus. It's so out of the ordinary. Yeah, he walked on water and, and he turned water into wine. He did all these miracles. But a virgin conceiving a child from God? That's why Christmas is, the, is, 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 such a, is such a miracle from heaven. Is that God has stepped into our world and it took faith for Mary and Joseph to receive this news and receive this calling on their lives. And so, so their willingness to step out of their comfort zones of what they thought was possible and to trust God, the Lord meets their faith with hope. You know, faith and hope are interconnected. That big faith in God is, re is rewarded with a heart full of hope. Listen to the, the words of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, so faith is the starting point of our relationship with God. That God, is, God has given us grace upon grace in Jesus. We receive it how? By faith. Everybody say faith. 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 Okay? We receive the good news of Christ by faith. Right? So faith is, faith is the first encounter. That's the first response of our heart towards God. Now check this out. We have been justified. We've been saved, forgiven. We belong to God through faith. Faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith, by faith into this grace in which we now stand. The reason you're here today is because of the grace of God. You're not self-made. You didn't deserve anything. It's, you are the, the byproduct. Your life is the byproduct of God's grace. By the end of the grace by, in, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So, so it starts with faith, and it ends with hope. I want you to see that. Faith is rewarded with hope. If you are willing to believe God, if you're, willing to, if you're willing to live a life of faith, if you're willing to receive what God has for you by faith, what you will find is, is that as you walk in faith and as you pour yourself out following Jesus, that the Lord is going to meet you and reward you with hope. Faith, give, faith gives way to hope. Faith is when you trust God even when you don't see. Faith is, is when you trust God and you don't understand. Faith is when you trust God and you still want to ask why. God, why? God, I don't, I'm not getting it. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not understanding why, why you've put me in this place. Faith is trusting even when you don't understand. And then when you see God come through in your life. And then when you see God show up in your life. And then when you see God act in your life. And God coming through on his promises. And you see his trustworthy character. What does it do? It fills you with hope. It fills you with hope that you can keep on trusting. That God's got your past, God's in control of your present, and God's in control of your future. So faith and hope go hand in hand, which is really, really, really important for us this Christmas. It's because Jesus has come to give you hope. What is hope? Is, is it going to West Town Mall? Morristown Mall used to have these little things too, I think. But is it going to West Town Mall in Knoxville and, and letting your kids flip pennies into the, into the water fountain, and they get to, you get to make a wish. You blow out your candles on your birthday cake. Man, I hope for a pay raise. I hope for, that I won't be late to dinner. I hope for a new car. I hope for someone to finally be nice to me, come into my life, befriend me. Hope is, hope is not a flimsy wish. In the Bible, hope is stronger than just flipping pennies into a water fountain. That hope in the Bible comes from God, that real hope comes from God. When the Bible talks about hope, it talks about something that's rock solid, something that's firm. It's not, it's not a guess. Oh, I hope that my Cowboys win today, even though I am hoping that. Trust me. I hope it snows, and I am, ho I am wishing for that too. But, thank you, but, but we'll have a prayer meeting after church. Uh, 
pray for it together. Here we go. So, but hope is a full guarantee that God is coming through. That it, it, it's a hope is a, a strong confidence that God will do good to us now and in the future. It's a strong assurance that God is making good on every word he's ever spoken. It's being certain that God is with me, that God is for me, that God's bringing about his good purpose in my life. Real hope from the Lord is not wishful thinking. It's based on who he is and what he's done. Jesus being born. Jesus living a sinless life. Jesus going to the cross to pay for my sins. Jesus rising again from the grave. Jesus right now in heaven, on the throne of heaven, ruling over this world. There's a hope that we have, and it's not a long shot. It's not, it's not trying to hit the dartboard in the dark. It's a confident expectation in God. Hope is a person. It's Jesus. At Christmas, hope was born to us that this Christmas, the Lord wants us to live and be filled with his hope. And so when we look at Jesus, the baby in the manger, that, that he's not, this is not an ordinary baby, that this is the embodiment of the hope that God is giving us. And let's, let's talk about that hope. This Christmas, the Lord wants you to have two hopes, two things you can, you can, tie, you can hit your wagon to. There are two things that you, can, that, you can, that you can count on. The first one is this, hope in God's faithfulness. God is faith. The Christmas story, the fact that Jesus came to be born, is it's about God being faithful. I mean, that, that this is this right here is not an accident. That 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 God decides in the life of Mary, the lifetime of Mary and Joseph to bring about the Savior of the world. This is not an accident here. That 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 at this point, the people of God were so weary and discouraged. Israel was a mighty nation they were, that was ruled by King David. They had a lot of infighting. They broke off into two different countries. They had wicked leaders who led them astray. And, 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 and all along, God raised up prophets. And these prophets showed up in Israel, and they were telling people to turn back to God, to repent and to seek the, the favor of the Lord, that the Lord is ready to forgive, you'll receive his mercy. Prophets were showing up all the time in the history of Israel, and they were trying to get the people to come back to the Lord here. And they were talking about, hey, listen, come back to God. God's going to send a Savior. God's going to send a King. God's going to send someone to come and rescue you. And for hundreds of years, for thousands of years even, almost a thousand years, the, the people of God waited and they waited. And when you, there, there comes a point where you wait and you wait and you wait and you don't, and you, it's just hard to wait anymore. And the world around them moved on that, they were, that the Greek empire rose and they left. And then the Roman empire comes up and, they're, and they are the, the evil overlords over the Jewish people. And they felt like God had just quit on them. That God just gave up. That God abandoned them. For 400 years, from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, for 400 years, 400 years, there were no prophets. There was not a spoken word from heaven that it seemed like God was silent. And they waited, and they waited on God, and they didn't have an answer. Lord, you, for hundred, you've been promising for hundreds of years that you were going to help us. Where are you? Ever pray a prayer like that? Lord, where are you? I thought you were going to help me. We've all prayed prayers like that. Lord, where are? Well, what's going on? What are you doing? I thought you. I thought you were. I thought you were handling this. What's happening? And they thought God moved on. And they lost all hope, and the world got darker, and the world, the world got darker. And yet, in the bleak midwinter of a dark and cruel world, God broke in with an announcement. God had, there, had not been a, there had not been a prophet for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, an angel comes from heaven. Hey, guys, the Savior of the world's coming. Prepare your hearts. He's on the way. Mary? 
I know this is totally out of left field and you weren't expecting it, but God looked at you and God says, I'm going to use you to bring about the Messiah. In other words, when that angel broke in in, in the, into the life of Mary and, and, and Joseph and Zechariah and Elizabeth, when, when, when God began to speak again, here's what he was announcing to the world. I am faithful to all of my promises. The hope of Christmas is a reminder that every spoken word that God has ever given, he makes good on. He is faithful. That, that, and we are encouraged to keep on trusting because of that. That the birth of Jesus is the good news that God makes good on, on his every promise. That God is faithful. And, and you and I, we wait in, in our lives, we wait and we wait and we wait and we're like, God, what's going on? Lord, I need you to resolve this problem. Lord, I've got all this, I've got all these responsibilities. I can't handle it anymore. I, I, I'm really hurting here. I need, you to, I need you to get me out of here. I need you to heal me. I need you to help me. I need you to guide me. And, and we wait and we wait upon the Lord and we're so tempted at times to give up. And yet Christmas is a reminder it's, it's, a, it's an encouragement to us, don't quit trusting the Lord. Why? Because God will make good on his promise to you in his own timing, that the Lord is faithful to you. That's what Christmas is a reminder about. And there are times where we want to throw our hands up in the air, and then we come to times like this of the year, and we look around and we remember that there's a baby born in a manger, and that little baby is the living embodiment that God is faithful to every promise. Right? And so, so, here, so, so every word he's ever spoken, let me just give you a couple of those. Let me just show you how in Jesus, God has made good on his promises. Let me give you a few Old Testament prophecies and promises about Jesus. God tells the serpent that the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head, Genesis 3. He, that he will come through the line of Abraham, Genesis 12. He will be David's offspring, 2 Samuel 7. He will be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7. He will be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. He will be, sin, he will be a sinless Perfect sacrifice, Psalm 40. He will do miracles, Isaiah 35. He will be despised and rejected, Isaiah 53. He will reign forever, Daniel chapter 7. He will enter into Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, he, will be, he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11. He will be a suffering servant, Isaiah 52 and 53. His blood will make atonement, Leviticus 17. He, he will be lifted up. On the cross, so we can live, Numbers 21. His hands and his feet will be pierced, Psalm 22. He will be resurrected, Psalm 16. He will conquer death, Isaiah 25. He will judge the world, Psalm chapter 9. And he will be a light for all the world, Isaiah chapter 11. That's just 19 out of hundreds of promises by God. Jesus coming in a manger at Christmas says that it's the Lord saying, I am faithful to every single word I've ever spoken. That if I said I will do it, I will do it. That ought to fill us up as we read scripture, as we worship, as we love and as we serve and as we do, as we live in a relationship with Jesus we ought to be encouraged that, you know what? The Lord is faithful to us. Nineteen of hundreds of promises that tell us that he's faithful. You can trust him. You should trust him. One reason we turn, we look at Jesus in the manger is because, is because we have a visible tangible reminder of his faithfulness. Here's what's interesting. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. In who? Jesus. Everything that God has spoken, every good blessing, every gift that God gives us, it is, it is answered, it is received, it is appreciated through Jesus. That the birth of Jesus is, a, is the is, is one more assurance 
that God's in control, that God's working for his people because he's faithful. Now, we have a problem in waiting. Israel had to wait a long time, and yet God's, God's timing is perfect. Galatians 4.4 4 says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So, so when God was ready, when it was the right time, and when it was God's perfect time, God sent forth Jesus. Why didn't God just make a promise and, and answer it and, and deliver on it immediately? It wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right time. That the birth of Jesus is, is a reminder that God isn't forgetful. God is not a negligent father to you. He is not unconcerned or uncaring towards you. As you live in this world, and trust me, we could go down the roads and we could talk about all the problems that we have and the sins that we have and the weaknesses that we have and the frustrations that we have and how we've been lied to and disappointed and let down. We could go through and talk about all of those things. As you face all kinds of problems in this world within yourself and in the, in the world around you, you need to know that God is faithful to you to bring about your good in his timing. Christmas is a reminder that if we will meet it, that if we will receive the, the word, the words of God with faith, that we will, we will be met with hope. Look at verse 23 of Matthew 1. The angel tells Joseph, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. What greater hope can we have that Jesus is with us right now, that he steps into our broken world to walk alongside of us. Christmas is proof positive that God is with us. Mary and Joseph take a big risk in believing uh, what God said about Jesus, and they needed to be reassured. And how did the Lord reassure them? The Lord is with you. Mary and Joseph would lose everything, and yet God would be faithful to them. Mary and Joseph would, would, lose, uh, would, lose, would lose their reputation, when, when word got out that she was pregnant, that they would lose their status. Joseph had a carpentry business. That would probably suffer. Can't trust that guy. And that their families would bear shame and reproach. They would have to pick up and move, possibly. I mean, like, like this is, like the pressure around them would have been significant. They, would, they became second-class citizens. But how, why would they bear this risk? Because God is with them. Why would they believe that? Because God is faithful. Mary and Joseph will become outcasts in this world, but that's okay because they belong to God. And as long as we live with faith in the Lord in this world, we will still have questions and we will wrestle with doubts and we will have sin and we will have weakness and we will have hardships in our life. And yet we are reassured that Jesus is with us always. He, he has been faithful in our past, he is faithful today, and he will be faithful to us tomorrow. We can live with hope, and we can live with faith because you are never, ever, ever outside of the presence of Jesus. He has committed himself to you. Christmas, he has committed himself to you. He has went all in on us. He is an ever-present help in our time of need. He, he is faithful. And he always will be. So we can trust him. So you can, place, you can place all of your hope, you can place all of your faith into the fact that God is always faithful. That's what Christmas shows us. And the second thing Christmas shows us is this. The second hope of Christmas is to have hope in God's saving grace. The birth of Jesus has a purpose. And it's to provide us with saving grace. We are broken by our sin. Look at, what, look at what Matthew 121 says. You, the angel tells Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Christmas is, 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 comes about to give us confidence that, that our sins are forgiven, that the baby in a manger is not an ordinary baby. So we, I, we mentioned earlier that Mary was a virgin. You're going, okay, she was a virgin, makes for a cute story. No, 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 it, it's, it's way more important than that. Here is what the virgin birth of Mary signifies, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He is fully God and fully man. He is not like your coffee creamer, half and half, or however, or maybe you have tea, half sweet, half unsweet, go to McDonald's, get both, right? 
half and half. He is not 50% God and 50% man. He is totally God, 100%. He is God, the Lord of heaven, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God existing in three persons. Jesus is not a created being. God did not make Jesus. Jesus is God, period, okay? Now, I tell you that because 73% of Americans believe that Jesus is created, that he did not always exist. And 43% of Americans don't believe Jesus is God. He's he's just a good moral teacher. He's a good person. He's special, but he's not God. I want you to understand, the virgin birth of Mary is to show us that he is 100% totally God, 100% divine. He is the maker of all that there is. And, And as God, he chose on his own prerogative to step down into our world by taking on human flesh, take, by, by, by having blood f- flow through real human veins. Jesus, who is God, he has command over nature. He has command over diseases. He has power over sin and evil. He has power over death. That same Jesus is also the same Jesus who became human. And he cried and he slept, and he needed to be held by his mother, and he needed to be nursed, and he had to be taught manners, and he had had to use the bathroom, that physically, emotionally, mentally, he became like us to identify with us, and yet he was without sin. He remained perfect. He was born of a virgin. Why? Why Why couldn't he have a human father? Because he avoided the sin nature of Adam. Romans 5 says that, that through Adam we've all sinned, that, that when Adam and Eve sinned, they passed that down, uh, that down, that, that the brokenness uh, in, our, in our own hearts down into our lives from generation to generation. And by Jesus not having a human father, he did not inherit Adam's sin, Adam's sinfulness. He was perfect. Why is that a big deal? You're saying, well, what's the big deal that he's sinless, that he's God, that he's fully man at the same time? Why does all that matter? Because Jesus is God. He represents God to us. We go, man, what kids ask this. I love when kids ask questions about God I, they're, because they're so simple, but they're so profound. Like I, I once I was serving at a church somewhere, and, and, and a little girl came up to me and said, what is God like? And I thought, what a beautiful question. What an amazing question. Maybe one of the most important questions we could ask. What is God like? How do we know what God is like? You look at Jesus because he is God. You look at Jesus and you see his love and his compassion and his grace for sinful and broken and tired people. We look at Jesus and you see that God is serious about dealing with sin. You look at Jesus and you see that God has victory and power over death and over over the enemy. You, so, so because Jesus is God, he shows the world what God is like. And because Jesus became fully human, he represents us to God. He goes back to his father and he says, Father, here they are, a bunch of prodigals, a bunch of wayward, weak, rebellious people going their own way. They need your saving grace. Here they are, Father. And I, I want to help, I want to save them. He has to be both. Fully God, fully man. Jesus steps into the middle to reconcile us to a loving relationship with God. It says that he's come to save us from our sin. Do you, do you know that sin is a threat to us? It, it's, it, he says that, he tells, the angel tells Joseph, he will save his people from their sins. You don't need saving from things that don't harm you. A, a, a cold water bottle, that's not going to hurt you. Pick that up. That's, you know, you can, t- you can touch that. You're, you're, you're two-year-old walking around just messing with stuff. They can touch that cold, uh, just a room temperature, luke, luke warm, cool water bottle. But when the stove is on, you keep them away. Why? Because the stove can hurt them. We only need to be saved from things that are dangerous to us. 
And sin is dangerous. It's a self-destructive cancer that, in, that has infected and ravaged our hearts and lives. Sin makes promises of giving you pleasure and success, and, they, and it never delivers. It makes, you think, it makes you think that you're wise in your own eyes. It, make, it leads you away from the Lord. It promotes you going your own way. But sin never brings you to the best version of yourself. Sin never fulfills the calling of your life that, God's, that God created you for. Sin pollutes and corrupts everything that it touches from how you think rationally. I mean, there, there are people that you know, if you don't know anybody, you're probably this person, but we love you anyway, that, that, that you just, there are people you know that you, 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 can't, you can't talk to them logically. Like they never have a rational conversation with you. It's always flying off the handle, off the wall. They don't make sense half the time. Why are, pe- why are people, it's like you listen to some people talk and you go, how do you think that way? Like, like, what, like what made you think that way? Like, how'd you, you know, how'd you, like, I'm not going to go. So, so, but, but your ability to think clearly and logically, like, that's affected. The conflict you have in relationships with people, that's affected by sin. By, how, uh, by, by, by dealing with by, or by having uh, personal addictions and habits and hang-ups that are devastating to your life and that tear apart your family. Like, those things bring about death and judgment in your life. That's what sin does. And Jesus comes at Christmas to give us the hope of his saving grace because he's come to save us from our sins. And the only way he can save us is by being fully God and fully man. As fully God, he doesn't need a substitute sacrifice for his sin. He doesn't have any. He's perfect. A perfect sacrificial lamb. And because he's fully man, he steps into our place at the cross. That baby in a manger, while we have our our nativity scenes and you watch child cartoons and Christmas and you're watching Hallmark movies and everything, that little baby in a manger, that baby's come to die. He's come to die because the greatest need of your life and the greatest need of my life is the saving grace of Jesus. We need God's compassion and mercy. And he comes to us in a manger at Christmas in order to lay down his life on the cross. It's why when you read on in Luke chapter 2, there's an old man in the temple cleaning things up, performing sacrifices. His name is Simeon. And Mary and Joseph, Simeon talks to Mary. And he tells her that a sword will pierce your soul. I mean, here you got, you got a you got a new young mom, right? Like, I mean, we have, we have a three, you know, three and a half month old uh, at home, and it and you know, and 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 she, for the most part, she's just a joy to ba- to be around. I can't. I, I think about her growing up, and I think about what our life will look like as she continues to grow, and and it's exciting. And you know, when you're when you're new and you got this baby, it's it's an exciting time. Uh, You know, that that God's blessing you and your family and you're expanding. And yet, Simeon tells her that a sword will pierce your soul. Why? How will Mary's heart be hurt because she's, she's carrying Jesus? You know, we sing that song, Mary, did you know that you're a baby boy? It's like, Mary... Do you really have an understanding of what your little baby boy is going to come to do? That he that you're going to, that you're going to nurse him and you're going to care for him and you'll teach him how to walk and he'll fall down and you'll be there to pick him up and you'll make sure he 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 has a safe place to lay his head at at night head on at night and and that he'll and that he'll and and that he'll get an education and he'll start to talk and he'll have friends in the community and and he and he'll he'll learn how to be a carpenter like Joseph his adopted father and and and, and you'll see him grow up and there'll be so much joys and so many so many milestone celebrations uh, in 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 his little life 
and that baby comes. At about 33 years old, to lay down his life on the cross. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, will be there. She will see her son be nailed to a cross, lifted up for the sins of the world. A sword will, will pierce your soul, Mary. That this child is special. This child's come to bring the saving grace of God and the hope of, of God to this world through his death and resurrection. The manger always points to the cross. The manger always points to the empty tomb. And I love this reality because for us, it is the best news in the world. So we were drowning in hopelessness. We're drowning in despair. We're, we're struggling. We are, we, are, we, are, we are in a dark and cruel and cold world, and yet God being so full of love and God being so full of mercy comes to us Jesus coming to pay for our sins so prodigals can come home to God. You know why I think God chose to use Mary and Joseph to, bring, to, 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 to fulfill his promises and, and show his faithfulness? God chooses to use insignificant people from a small, nowhere, podunk town to show you and me the kind of people he's come for. He's not come for the elite, the 1%, the people with their names up in lights. He's come for us because the grace of God always rolls downhill to the lowliest and the weakest and the weary and, and the dirtiest. He's come for us. Ordinary, common people from a nowhere place that the grace of God is for you. It's for you. That's the hope of Christmas. That God is faithful to his promises. And that because God's faithful to his promises, you can hope in his saving grace. And so with that said, let me share with you my prayer. My prayer for you this Christmas season is that for every carol that you hear, for every light that you see and every present that you buy, you would be reminded of the hope that has come into this world. That he has come for you. And I want to, I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to take a risk like Mary and Joseph and believe in that hope. Believe that God is faithful, believe that his saving grace is for you, because it is. Will you stand with me?